Um, but as we start, uh, I'd like to uh, just read our passage of scripture for this morning, which is Psalm 23. We've been studying out of that. We're going to study a little bit more, but I thought it'd be good to, to read that, especially in light of what's going on this morning. So Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That's a good way to start the morning. And especially with all the alerts and the, the fear that may be going through people this morning, it's a good thing to start with. Just a few announcements before we get started. Um, there's, uh, we're kicking off next week. Uh, long weekend's over, school's back in, all that jazz. So Sunday school is one of the things that starts on Sunday. So please do come. There'll be a class for all ages. And, uh, and so we'll have the adults over in that class and the kids in various different spots. Pastor Joe will help you get to where you need to get to go. I don't know if that made any sense at all, but it made sense as it came out of my mouth. Um, we'll also do a lunch after. Uh, so we'll do uh, kind of a, we'll, bu we'll buy lunch and uh, you just need to bring a dessert. And then we're going to go play softball and kickball over at the Reynolds Fields. Uh, Larry Spratt and Brendan Weisberg are going to be leading those two games. So you please do come for those. It's a great way. Even if you're not a kickball fan, just come and hang out and visit. It's a great way to start the year and catch up with people. We've been away a lot this summer. Everyone's gone everywhere. So uh, do come back. And then next to that in your bulletin, there's a whole column of stuff that's starting. So the Mom's Time Out, Kids Club, Stony Lake has their corn raise. We need media volunteers. So I, I definitely want to pump that because I forgot last time. So I'm sorry, Vicki. But uh, we do need people to help with the Easy Worship slides. And, uh, and if you could volunteer for that, we'd really appreciate it. It's actually really easy. Believe it or not, you can do this no matter what age you are. As long as you can read and click, you can do this, okay? Evie says it's very easy. Evie would also like you to volunteer so she doesn't have to do it three out of four Sundays a week. Um, also, just uh, if you're, if you're um, wondering what's happening and when, and, and I've started sending out the passage that we're studying ahead of time, you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner this text message update. All you need to do if you have a smartphone is get out your camera and scan that QR code that's in the bottom. It will actually bring up a text message if you text P-A-B-C. That's P-A-B-C, not pancakes. If you have an iPhone, it's going to think you want to put pancakes in there. All right, if you have an Android, I don't know what it'll, what it'll put, but make sure it's just the text, P-A-B-C, and we'll be able to get you onto our update list. That's everything that we do, things that we're praying for, announcements that we have, scripture passages that we're studying, everything that pertains to all of us comes through that app. So it's very, very helpful and, and, and good to use. Why don't we pray and commit our service to the Lord? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. Thank you that we can gather together to worship you on this beautiful day. Lord, thank you for the good start to harvest that we've had for a windy, hot day yesterday. Thank you for keeping people safe on the fields, Lord. Father, I pray that as we start this morning, that we would do so knowing that you are with us. Father, we know that there are several people who are hurt, injured, fearful, and scared right now. And so, Father, I pray for the, the helicopters that are coming to Melfort. I pray that there would be safety in landing and that they would be able to get the victims to the doctors that need to give them attention. I pray that you would help the doctors to repair those bodies and that you would help the nurses and doctors here in town as they deal with emergencies, that you would guide them and direct them, that you would help them with triage and that you would keep those victims alive. And Lord, I pray for the RCMP as they search for these two men. And I pray that they would be apprehended and brought to justice as soon as possible. We pray, Lord, that you would resolve this situation by the end of this morning. Father, we thank you for the people who attend our church, for Don and for Chris and his girls. We pray that you would bless them today, especially Don as he's in hospital, Lord, waiting to recover, wanting to get over the infection that he's been dealing with. I pray that you would help, that you would heal his body and help him to get rid of that infection. 
Lord, we thank you that our church is involved in an association that cares about church planting. And Lord, as the church plants in, our, in the AGC go forward in different spots, I pray that you would honor them and that you would bring many people out to those places. We thank you for the churches here in town and we pray for the Salvation Army and for their new captain, Glenda. We ask that you would help her to start her ministry here in Melfort well. And as we get together on Wednesday, Lord, I pray that as she meets, new past, meets the pastors here in town, that she would be encouraged with the peer group that she's working with. We thank you for the other churches in, Mel, in, uh, in the AGC, for Delburn, as they minister today. We pray that you would bless them. And we also pray, Lord, that you would uh, just be with the family of Gwen Thorpe as they mourn her. Lord, uh, she was a part of our church as well, and, uh, and we mourn her loss. Lord, as we get together on, on Monday at, uh, at the funeral home, we pray that you would bless that service. And we thank you, Lord, for the end of a good life and the beginning of a new one. We pray for Ezra as he begins his life with his family, with Emily and with Damien. And we thank you for that, Lord. We love you. We commit the service to you. And we are excited to serve you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, good morning and welcome to uh, Park Avenue Bible Church. My prayer this past week as I was choosing songs and preparing for this morning is that, that we would, after we leave this place this morning, that we'd have just a little bit better understanding of how wide, how high, and how deep God's love for us is. And to help us in that direction, we're going to get you to stand and we'll sing a couple of songs that go back to the 1960s. Yes. So, uh, so hopefully you will know them. If not, you'll catch on fairly quickly to them. And then we'll sing some more, more contemporary songs. But we'll start off with some songs that go back to the early 1960s. So uh, let's see how many of you will be able to catch on real quick, okay? Let's go. There will never be a sweeter story, story of the Savior's love divine, a love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, yes, wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to Boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the farthest soul away. Saving, keeping love, it was that found me. That is why my heart can truly save. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, yes, wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Love beyond our human comprehending. Love of God in Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme and never ending. Great redeeming love of Calvary. No instruments, okay? Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, yes, wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Not bad, not bad. Let's sing a. a in Bible college, we had a, a list, of songs, list of songs that was called the Hash Course. I should maybe tell you this, but. We had a teacher that always liked to ask us to sing a chorus in the beginning. And we always chose the chorus that was the longest. This is the one, okay? Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of a saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. For we'll be dwelling together. How happy we shall be through all eternity. For we'll be dwelling together my lord and i love him better every day i love him better every day close by his 
God, I will abide. I love Him better every day. And that's enough to make me sing. And that's enough to make me sing. My sins are all forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. That's enough to make me, that's enough to make me, that's enough to make me sing. Not bad, not bad, not bad. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross He suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, sing of my Redeemer with His blood He purchased me on the cross my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell a wondrous story, how my lost estate to save. In His boundless love and mercy, He the ransom freely came. Sing, oh sing, the my Cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer, and his triumph and power I'll tell. How the victory given over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh, sing. sing of my Redeemer and His family love for me. He from death to life had brought me in the pond with Him to be. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer with His blood He purchased me on the cross You may be seated. Now we'll move into the 21st century. Yet not, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Or by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will be in me. Through the deepest Overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. 
night I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my queen. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only My lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. get you to stand one more time and we're going to teach you a new song and again talking about just the things that we enjoy because of our relationship with Jesus Christ Let us worship our King, come let us bow at His feet, He has done great things. See what our Savior has done, see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted I, O oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm, you've been faithful forevermore, you have done great things. And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things O oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave You free every captive and break every chain O oh, God, you have done great things we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unchanging. 
unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God above it all. Hallelujah, God unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great Heaven of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. Amen. Amen. One more song. This may be for the older kids, like the 60s and 70-year-old older kids, <laughs> because it's a course from when I was a child. But maybe you know it. So anyway, here it goes, okay? I'm so happy and here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away Now I'm singing as the days go by Jesus took my burdens all away Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin Jesus took the load and gave me wonderful peace within my heart And now I'm singing as the days go by Jesus took my burdens all away Great, thank you, God. Bless may be seated. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Karina, and I'm the prayer co coordinator here at Park Avenue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so today is part two of Psalm 23, and so I thought this would be a good opportunity for us to turn Psalm 23 and make it a personal prayer for Park Avenue. I say that being a little bit disjointed because I also felt so passionate that for the kids that were with us today, that I should remind them about the importance of praying the armor of God prayer before they go to school. So if you have children and you prefer to go uh, on that route, that's great. Both, I think, are really important uh, ways to pray uh, spiritual warfare type prayers. The Psalms are just an amazing, really, book of prayer. And if you want to learn how to pray or grow in prayer, I think praying the Psalms verse by verse is a great way to do that. And so, again, on the theme of school, I did the homework for us this week. So you'll see I put some prayer prompts by each verse. But I really do encourage you to take this Psalm or another Psalm and, and meditate on it. In truth, when I first read Psalm 23, although it's very famous and well known, I didn't, it wasn't my most favorite, and I don't say that often because I love the Word of God, but I didn't really like the words rest or still in, in the Psalm, and so I struggled with it. But over the years, I've come to realize that those words are such a key component to us going deeper in our relationship with the Lord. And really praying and using verses like Psalm 23 are a great way for us to understand, like David did, how God cares for us and he's with us in the highs and the lows of life. And so with that, uh, we'll start our prayer time reading the Word of God together. And so to show you that praying the Psalms is um, something that we actually see in the Bible quite a lot, I've given you two uh, examples of where um, Christians have prayed the Psalms, including Jesus. And then I also put there uh, the scripture where it talks about the importance of putting on the armor of God. So let's turn together to the blue part of our sheets. When they heard the report, 
All the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthan, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Okay, enjoy your prayer time and I'll come up and close us off in a bit. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that when we come to you in prayer, Lord, that we know that there's blessings in your yes. And thank you, Lord, that we know that there's blessings in your no's. And thank you that there's blessings everywhere we go. And Lord, I just pray for Psalm 23 and all of the Psalms in your Bible, Lord. I pray that they can bring us hope and comfort and victory, Lord, and that they can help each one at Park Avenue to grow in a deep, intimate relationship with you. Thank you for the power of prayer, Lord, and thank you for choosing us, Lord, to be your light and your salt in our community and in our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. This is so loud, Joe, I don't know. <clears throat> Not that I don't want you all to hear every sniff and snuffle coming out of my nose, but anyways. <sighs> well, if, you're, if you have your Bible, Psalm 23, if you don't have your finger there already, hopefully you do. Last week, I, uh, I picked up a book that I've read six or seven times uh, called The Fellowship of the Ring. Some of you may have heard of it or read it or whatever, but uh, it's one of my favorite books and it's one of my favorite series of books written by a believer from way back in the day named J.R.R. Tolkien. And throughout all three of the books, in fact, even the, the beginning book, The Hobbit, one of the major themes in those books as they go through this epic story is the importance of companionship, the, important, the importance of companionship. I just can't preach with a cough candy in my mouth. It's not going to work. Um, all three of those books focus strongly on friendship and companionship in the face of overwhelming danger. Frodo, the main character, and Sam, his friend from home, are incredibly close friends, particularly Sam. Frodo tries to get rid of Sam a few times throughout the journey, and Sam never budges. He always stays right next to Frodo, even though it's going to mean eventually, well, it looks like it's going to mean their deaths. And as I thought about this book, it occurred to me that companionship is actually a huge thing for people, for heroes, for all kinds of characters in literature and movies and, and all kinds of things. The heroes of stories almost always have someone with them. We see teams of people accomplishing amazing things, whether they're normal or they're supernatural. Rarely is there a true hero who is truly alone. Even when a hero sacrifices his or her life by themselves, they're doing it to save others. It doesn't happen unbeknownst to anybody. It usually happens. The hero gets the strength for what they're going to do from somebody or for somebody, they rarely operate in a vacuum. And I think this reflects a basic truth about humanity that we were meant to live and function in community with one another. Yeah, I mean, like there are times when we want a break from people. I mean, that's, that's normal. But it's not often that there are people who truly love being totally alone. All right, now I'm not talking about being introverted, okay? Because there's lots of introverts out there. But I'm talking about the true hermit, right? The person who doesn't need nor wants people around. Those are rare. We need each other. We need companionship. 
And further to that, we need leadership. We need someone to put our faith and trust in, someone to look to when we need a plan, someone to walk with us through difficulty, knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And we need that leadership at a human level, but more importantly, we need it at a spiritual level, right? God has put eternity into our hearts. And because of that, our spirit cries out for leadership from God and for answers to the eternity that it wrestles with. We need a companion on that journey. We can't do that by ourselves. We need humans and we need God. The first thing that God said wasn't good. Do you remember what that was? For man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. We need people. We need God on the, on the journey that we have that as we walk through this life. And we're going to study that today in Psalm 23. We're going to see that exact principle operating in David's life. We saw it last week. We're going to see it again this week that Jesus, our good shepherd, gives us all that we need, leads us to peaceful places, restores our souls in a temporal and in eternal sense. And those are just the three, first three verses. Today, we're going to try to wrap up Psalm 23 and talk about our amazing God, who he is, what that means for us, his children, his sheep. So let's read Psalm 23 one more time. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint me by, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. So when we looked at the first three verses of this last week, we discovered a whole lot of good about the, the, the Lord and the relationship that we have with him. So let's just keep digging right into that, all right? The, the last part of verse three says, he guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. That's a big comfort for us because, and for any sheep actually, because we need guidance. As we go along the way in life, God, our good shepherd and our father will guide us along the right paths, bringing honor and glory to his name. When we look at David's life in reflection on this, we can see that it's true. We can see that God guided him in various aspects, in fact, all aspects of his life. When he was on the run from Saul, he was guided by God. He hid in caves and he was safe, right? And as he stayed, and sorry, as he had victory over victory over victory with the Philistines, all starting with that massive victory that God guided him to over Goliath with just a sling. He was being guided by God all the time. And then we have, actually, David reigned for about 40 years. That's a long time. And we don't have 40 years worth of details in the scriptures, which means that no news was good news, right? That God was guiding David in the times when we don't hear about exactly what he did. <laughs> and I thought, man, guidance... That's something we desire. That's something we crave deeply. When we don't know what to do, we look for help. Or we should look for help. I don't know, there's still probably a joke here about men in directions. But like when we need help, we should and we must ask for it. This speaks to the importance of a lot of stuff that God has put in place for you. First, it speaks to the importance of the body of Christ right? This room is full of people who love Jesus, who know his word and his will for many different walks of life. And we need each other to get through this life. Did you know that statistically throughout maybe, well, North America for sure, and possibly the world, that there are more young people looking for mentors than ever before. So folks that are older, let's just say over 50, are you mentoring someone? Are you speaking into the life of a younger person? And if you're not, why not? Is it because the enemy has you convinced that you have nothing to offer? Don't allow him to sit at the table. We'll talk about that later. We are all crying out for guidance and the Lord has given us each other. So young people, younger people under 50, get out there and ask someone from help, for help. Don't be proud. 
Older people, answer the call. This is a both and situation. We need each other for guidance. We need each other all the time. And the Lord's guidance is very present in our lives and it comes through each other quite a bit. It also comes through directly. Sometimes God will speak to you through a vision or a dream or maybe even an audible voice or something along those lines. We also have the Bible and we should be constantly searching the scriptures for guidance about what God wants us to do. There are so many different ways that God has given us guidance. This week, a friend and I talked briefly about a kind of concerning situation. We prayed and boom, within three or four hours, each of us independently of one another had the same answer. It was amazing. We just, we asked God for guidance and we, we thought we knew the right way. And actually God used his word to show us it was actually a different thing that he wanted us to do. It was awesome. And it was a challenging situation. We really needed that guidance. And, and we have that guidance all the time. The Lord has given us everything we need for life and for godliness, right? We have himself, we have the spirit, we have each other, we have the word, we have the guidance we need. We just need to humble ourselves and ask for it or go searching for it. And then when we find it, we follow it and we bring honor and glory to the name of God. So just by living, we can bring glory to God if we are going with his guidance. But that doesn't mean it's easy. There's something sometimes that we get a little bit confused about where we think, well, if I'm doing God's will and obeying God, that it should be easy. And it's not. At times, doing the right thing, maybe even most times, doing the right thing costs us something, and it's hard, right? It, but it brings honor to the Lord's name, which means it's the right path. Even though it's hard, it's good. Right and easy don't always coincide. And that can be confusing and difficult, which we're going to see a little bit later. But there's the flip side to that statement, right? You guide me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. But what happens if we're not on the right path? What happens if we're on a path that doesn't bring honor to the Lord's name? Because those times happened in David's life too, right? We know that we have also perhaps not done honor to the Lord's name. We've heard and we've studied that in David's life. And for sure, I know you've experienced a time when you were not bringing honor to the Lord's name and something happened. And I think what happens is discipline, right? Where God says, nope, Phil, you need to be back here. You're way out here. We're going to bring you in, right? And those are difficult and painful times. It's so easy to say God brought me alongside because I was far astray. But usually that's a painful journey. Usually that hurts a whole lot being disciplined, brought back onto the right path. But thankfully, God does it. Lots of times we kind of resent the discipline and we don't like the discipline of the Lord. But Hebrews tells us, don't reject his discipline. Why? Because he's treating you as his child. He's treating you as a son or a daughter, giving you a spanking. All right, and that's kind of hard to hear because we don't like spankings, but really God shows that he loves us because an unloving action, not an unloving action, for a human it would be, but for a human to, say, to just go on, let someone go on and keep hurting themselves, that would be difficult. And sometimes God lets us go a little bit farther away so that we get hurt and we come back, right? But he brings us back eventually. He disciplines those that he loves. He's bringing us back onto the right paths so that we can once again bring honor to his name. And in the, even in that, even in his discipline, he's showing us grace because of the next verse in this passage. This is like my favorite part of what I learned this week in verse four, right? Probably the, one of the more famous passages in the Bible. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear for you are with me, Right? So there's a few reasons that we would find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death. Some, someone might do something that puts us in the valley of the shadow of death, right? Someone may do something cruel to you or, or say something discouraging to you. And you find yourself going through a very difficult time as a result of that. And sometimes just circumstances. It wasn't anybody's fault. We just find ourselves walking through a very difficult time. It feels like the valley of the shadow of death. And sometimes God allows us or puts us 
in the valley of the shadow of death. But the wonderful, beautiful thing is that Jesus is always there no matter why we're in the valley of the shadow of death. No matter why we're in the valley, he's there. He's there when someone seriously hurts you and makes you fall into a depression. He's there when someone makes a choice that rattles your entire world. He's there when tragedy strikes your family. He's there when you make a sinful choice and you suffer because of it. David's life shows all of those aspects, right? When David's life was threatened and he had to flee, the Lord was there. When tragedy struck David's country, the Lord was there. And when David sinned with Bathsheba, the Lord was right there. And as that little baby died, as we studied, David was not away from God. He was in the presence of God, on his knees, pleading to spare the baby. And when the baby died, God was there. And David was worshiping at the Lord's feet, no longer pleading with the Lord to spare the baby, but just worshiping him for his grace and his mercy and his presence with him. All of these circumstances must have been absolutely heart-wrenching for David. It must have felt like life was over. But God was there, and God had a rod to protect David, and he had a staff to control and discipline David. And there was no need to fear, even in the very valley of the shadow of death, because God was there, and he has a rod to defend you, and he has a staff to corral you, in case you get out of control. There's no need to fear because God's perfect love drives out fear. Now here's something to consider. Is the path through the valley of the shadow of death one of the right paths that brings honor to the name of God? Is the path through the valley of the shadow of death one of the right paths that can bring honor and glory to the name of God? This is some of the harder truth about God, right? But I absolutely believe that that is a true statement. That the right paths that God puts us on have the great and amazing potential of bringing honor to the name of Jesus even if they run right through the valley of the shadow of death. We grow and develop far more through adversity and difficulty than we do through pleasant experiences, don't we? Growth is not found on the mountaintop. Growth is found in the valley of the shadow of death. It's down in that valley that we grow and we change and we become dependent on our good shepherd. Because, and if the result of the being dependent on the good shepherd is taking the path through the valley of the shadow of death, then it is a right path that brings glory to the name of God. Now, you might think that this is cruel or unfair of God, and I absolutely can see why. It's one of the biggest difficulties that people have with God, that he allows pain and suffering into the lives of his kids and into the lives of people who don't belong to him. Why would a good God do that? Is the cry of the world against Christians and against God. This happens even now this week as we kind of deal with the consequences of what someone did at Redberry Bible Camp. Right? Why would God allow this to happen? Is one of the arguments that gets thrown out there. It doesn't seem that God, it doesn't seem right that God would be the cause of bad things. But here's the thing. He is always with us in the valley, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you're with me. He's there all the time. And sometimes he makes us walk through that valley and he walks with us. And that's great. And many, many times we choose to walk through the valley through our own stupidity and pigheadedness and rebellion against God. And he still comes. We are his flock and he is our good shepherd. And he will not abandon you even though you make a determined effort to walk away and do your own thing. That's what intentional sin is, right? We say to God, I don't love or respect you. So I'm going to go do my own thing and to hell with the consequences. And God, the gracious good shepherd, comes with us and stands with us in the midst of our wickedness so that we will not be alone so that he can help us pick up the pieces. When you think about it, that's not fair either. But it comes out unfair in our favor and so we're totally cool with that. 
No one ever returned 500 bucks because the bank made an error in your favor. I shouldn't say no one. Maybe you did. I didn't. But it wasn't $500 either. Anyways. You think about that though? You often say it's totally unfair that God would let evil happen. But it's also totally unfair that we would make a choice to say something horrible to God and go do our own thing and he still comes. That's not fair either. And so praise the Lord that he is willing to walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death because sometimes he puts us there, but many times we choose that path and we walk down that road. Through our faith in Jesus, if we've chosen to believe in him, we become God's sheep. And therefore, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And sometimes he will guide us through the valley of shadow of death on purpose. And other times we walk down there. But either way, you're never alone. That, uh, that phrase, never alone, excuse me, has been driven into me by my father. And he didn't even mean to. But every morning when I was... I don't know, from about age 11 to 14, he would take a shower and the bathroom and my bedroom were right next to each other. And he would always sing this hymn called Never Alone. And to this day, I can hear him singing, I've seen the lightning flashing, I've heard the thunder roll. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not sing it, but I'm gonna read the rest of it. This is, what I, this is what I heard every day. I've seen the lightning flashing, I've heard the thunder roll. I felt sin's breakers dashing, which tried to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of my Savior. He bid me still fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. <clears throat> the world's fierce winds are blowing, temptations sharp and keen. I have a peace in knowing my Savior stands between. He'll sta he stands to shield me from danger when all my friends are gone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. And the last verse says this. When in affliction's valley, I tread the road of care. My Savior helps me carry my cross so heavy to bear. Through all, though all around me is darkness and earthly joys are flown, my Savior whispers his promise never to leave me alone. We need to praise the Lord that we are never alone. And as awesome as verse four is, verse five and verse six are so good too. No wonder we love this Psalm so much, Karina. Verse five, <laughs> verse five says this, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. This is a spiritual warfare verse, although we may not think of it that way. God is so powerful and so awesome and you are so safe in his hands and that David paints a picture of God setting a table with you and him sitting down in the presence of enemies all around you. And we know that we fight against the enemy, Satan, the accuser, and all of his fallen angel demons. We sit in their presence with God having supper. How awesome a picture is that? That's how safe you are. And it's a great picture because it happens in real life with these sheep all the time. When David was a shepherd, he talked to Saul about it. And this is what he said. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. And when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, lion or bear, okay? Remember lion or bear. I go after it with a club and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. I don't know about you, but I couldn't do that. I'd be like, well, that sucks, but the lamb had, the sheep had triplets this year, so we can do without one, right? <laughs> and if the animal, if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. Have you guys thought about how intense that is? Have you ever tried to kill an animal with a club? Me and my brother tried to kill a cat once. It was not good. We did not succeed. We couldn't do it. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. David is an intense guy. He cares about his sheep so much. 
And if David can care about a little sheep who is infinitely replaceable, how much more does God care about you? So you are so safe and you are so cared for that he puts a table in the middle of a circle of demons and Satan himself, and you are safe to sit there and eat with him as the enemy looks on. That's incredible. In plain sight of predators, David leads his sheep to green pastures and still waters. Same thing with us here and now. We live in a hard world to be a follower of Jesus. The enemy prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. And the enemy's servants are always trying to discourage us and attack us. And in the middle of it all, God prepares a table for you. And the enemy watches. Christians... We gather, we eat, we play, we pray, and we live in the midst of our enemies, all made possible by the fact that God is our good shepherd and he stands guard over us. He not only walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death, he stands guard with over us while we live in the place that he's prepared for us. How great is our God? Like, it's not just provision, it's honor, it's blessing. That's what anointing is. He looks at you and he says, Keith, you're mine. I'm going to honor you and I'm going to pour oil on your head. That is a huge honor. It sets you apart. In, in ancient times, you anointed the leader of the people. You anointed the king over the nation. You didn't just do it to anyone. And so God looks at you and he loves you and he chooses you and he anoints you. Praise the Lord. You have a special place in his heart. You are safe in his arms. And this, if all of that isn't enough, think about Jesus. The son of God. He came, he died. And not only that, but he left so that the Holy Spirit would come who lives literally inside of you. You have God literally living in you. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have been chosen and elevated far beyond what you deserve because of Jesus. And our cup overflows with blessings all day long. And those blessings are apparent all the time. Even in the midst of difficult times, we have blessings. I was talking to Leon and Sophia. Yesterday, they burnt a combine belt and it landed on the ground and it started a fire, but it didn't go anywhere. And they got the combine off the field and it was fine. I didn't ask your permission to share that story, but I just can't help it because your cup overflows with blessings. So I'm sorry if I uh, went over the line there. But we all have those blessings, right? Right? We all have things happening in our lives that God is clearly obvious and visible in. Please notice those things. Praise him for those things. And there's just one other thing, though. Don't give the enemy a seat at the table. This has been a challenge in my life over the last couple of years. Don't let the enemy sit at the table. Or he's going to attack you. He's going to try to make you doubt the goodness of God and the intentions of his people. The enemy deeply desires a seat at that table with Jesus in you. Don't let him. Don't listen to the sinful temptations that he throws at you. Don't listen for the words of doubt and insecurity that he tries to worm into your mind. Don't let him anywhere near you and God. When you sense a thought train leading you down a path that is evil and wrong and will discourage you, pray about it and keep Take those thoughts captive and ask Jesus to deal with them. When you see something that you know is wrong or when you want to touch something that you know you can't, remember that the Lord has provided you with everything that you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything sinful. Don't let the enemy sit at the table. If you want more of that, Louis Giglio has an amazing book with that exact title. I stole that title. He has a book literally called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at the Table. Well worth the read, especially if you're struggling with resisting the enemy. Because that's what we have to do. And the Bible says that if we resist the enemy, he will flee from you. So let's set the enemy running from the table that Jesus has set before us. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And finally, the last verse, which is the icing on the cake. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. 
Last Sunday, Don Spratt came up to me and asked if I was going to preach on the sheep dogs of heaven. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I've never heard that before. But it's those two things, the goodness and mercy that are pursuing you all the days of your life. What an incredible reality for the disciple of Jesus, for one of the sheep of his flock. Sheep dogs are meant to keep the flock close, right? To direct it, to keep it close to the master. God uses goodness and mercy to do this for us. We are his sheep, we're his children. His sheep dogs are goodness and mercy. And we've all been incredibly blessed and God has been so good to us. And even through the experiences within the valley of the shadow of death, that time and time again, we experience God's goodness. And when we screw up and we sin and we go astray, goodness and mercy are still pursuing us. David saw that time and again. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, his mercy was visible. And even if, whether it was the angel who didn't level Jerusalem or the fact that David didn't lose his life in the affair with Bathsheba, the goodness and mercy of God were also always close to him. And I think we need to take time and reflect on our life experience, our daily life experience to see where God's goodness and mercy has pursued us and stayed close to us. It would be a good thing to do every day to fully appreciate the presence of God in your life. I thought, well, that, so that song that we sang last week about the goodness of God, right? That, that your goodness is running after me, running after me. I think that's an excellent, excellent use of that passage. But then I thought of the other things that people have pursuing them all the days of their life. Things like addictions, demons, actual enemies, debt. We have goodness and mercy. Christians get goodness and mercy. Everyone else gets everything else. Praise the Lord that we are his kids. And ultimately, it all goes somewhere. There's a destination. And that's why this is the best verse of them all. Because God, our good shepherd, who gives us everything that we need while we're here on earth, is ultimately leading us to his home. The destiny of those who have put their faith in Jesus is life in paradise with our good shepherd forever. And he's going to put us in green pastures forever. And we will be beside still waters forever. And we will be <clears throat> where our souls will be permanently restored with no fear of sin and no pain and no death forever. And we will have new bodies forever given to us by the good shepherd where, we're, where we will be honored for the new life we lived in obedience to him. We will be in paradise with him and soon. I don't know if many of you knew Gwen Thorpe really well, but I remember that when I talked to Welma, she had visited with her on Friday, Friday afternoon outside in the gazebo. And on Saturday afternoon, Gwen went for a nap and she died. There was no overarching de debilitating illness. There was no fear of death on her. She literally went to sleep and she is now literally living the dream. What an amazing way to end. And all of us, we're not going to get that end. We are not all going to have a peaceful exit into the next life. But doesn't matter how you get there. The fact is that you get there. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise the Lord. Nothing that touches you during this life can ever take away your salvation. You are safe. You are secure because of who God is, not because of who you are. Praise the Lord and we should. So let's pray and we'll sing together. Lord Jesus, it is so good to know that we are your children, that those of us who have put our faith in you will live with you forever and ever. Amen. We are so glad, Lord, that you have prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies and that one day, Lord, all the enemies will be gone. We are so glad for that too. Lord, may we live in joy even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death because you are with us. In your name, amen. The song we want to close with this morning is a, a hymn that you're well familiar with, but maybe don't know the history of it, written by a fellow named, by the name of Joseph Scrivens. Joseph was an individual who experienced the valley of the shadow of death. Shortly before he uh, was going to get married, his wife-to-be his wife died 
in a drowning accident. He moved from Dublin to Canada, got re-engaged, but before they were able to get married, she died of an illness. And then shortly after that, his, wife started, his life started to go down as far as health-wise was concerned. And in 1855, he wrote this song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's an incredible song. And uh, there's a fourth verse that we'll be singing today that actually summarizes everything Pastor Phil said about the last verse of Psalms 23. Let's stand together we sing it. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often fall Trials and temptation Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged Take it to the Lord in prayer Can we find a friend so Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Listen very carefully to verse 4, okay? Blessed Savior, thou hast promised, thou wilt all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory, bright and clouded, there be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and endless worship will be all our portion there. So a few times I've, I've, I've alluded to who is this for, and, and I want to make sure that we all know that this is, the, this is a psalm that's addressed to the people of God. If you don't consider yourself a person of God, or someone who trusts Jesus, or any of those kind of pithy sayings I've thrown out there. If you want to talk about that, I would love to talk with you about that. If you're not sure what being a Christian even means, please do talk to somebody here. I know that there's tons of people who would love to tell you, but God waits to walk with you. He is knocking on the door. He is your good shepherd. There are so many different metaphors, but the, what needs to happen is repentance, right? Repent and believe, and the Lord comes in and washes your sin clean. If that's you, if you need to know about that, if you have a question about that, please come talk to me or one of the elders or Joe or honestly, anyone next to you probably can tell you something. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for your presence with us. We love you. We trust you. Please keep us safe on the fields. Please keep us thankful in our hearts. Please keep the armor of God on us and help us to resist the devil. Thank you for preparing a table before us. We look forward to the day we go to be with you. In Jesus' name.